going to be starting full-time May 17th. I joined um, actually originally as a fellow and it, it changed pretty quickly. Um, so right now I'm racial and economic disparities coordinator for Utah Housing Coalition. Um, and one of the reasons I was brought on is because uh, of course, as, as we've seen in this um, past year and change with COVID, um, there have been some pretty uh, deep and, and you know underlying issues um, seen in communities of color that have been brought out by the pandemic and that um, have kind of always uh, there's always been some, some intrinsic issues uh, in housing in terms of racial disparities, economic disparities, gender disparities, you name it, right? Um, so that's part of why, uh, why I was brought on is because um, Utah Housing Coalition is going to take um, a much more intentional approach in work going forward. Um, and I'm very excited to do that. And thank you very much for having me. Well, I'm, I'm not feeling too chill. Thank you so much, Olga. And I will ask if you are not muted, please mute yourself. Um, like I said before, I can do that, but it's a little bit difficult when I have 35 people. So uh, before we begin our presentation on the senior report, um, I would like to kind of give a quick update on the work that we've been doing. Some of you participate in many of our you know, meetings um, that we are part of since COVID hit, uh, but just as a, as a recap, so um, last, you know, COVID and the, the social unrest movements that took place, not only, you know, across the country, but was a worldwide movement, um, a movement that woke us up on so many levels um, to address um, racial injustice and housing and inequality, our first step to have at our conference a third day dedicated completely to, to the issue and also have Heather McGee as a keynote speaker. Heather at the time was in the process of publishing her book, Some of Us, and since the, the, public, the, the book was published in late January, she has been all over the uh, cable news, print news, um, talking about her book and the issues and um if you have not purchased her book i highly encourage you to do so it's a it's a it's a really uh well documented book about how racism um, affects all of us and uh with that being said um we um dedicated our efforts to to work on the issue so the most significant uh grant that came our way was from national income housing coalition it's um um it's a part of a kind of uh, multi-state effort to figure out um best practices in emergency rental assistance during COVID and also eviction prevention. And each state is kind of taking a different appro approach based on what's happening in their communities. And we are very, very lucky that we're able to connect with a wonderful researcher that works for the state, um, uh, Hoel, and he is the main researcher in this project uh, where we're gonna conduct uh, surveys with case managers from community action agencies, uh, with people that have received rental assistance, and also surveys with people have been evicted during COVID. And the final product was will be a report that will be published at the end of September. Additionally, uh, Synchrony uh, Bank um, helped us with a grant uh, for the uh, publication of the, the report in September. We also had received a significant grant from Intermountain Healthcare, that basically was a seed grant for Olga's position, which is the Racial and Economic Disparities Project Coordinator. And we would like to introduce the project as such, but at the core, um, the work um, that Olga will, will do will be at the core of all of our work. And it's so much based on Heather McGee's um, findings that racism affects all of us. And, um, so we are very uh, thankful for IAC, uh, a healthcare entity that provided significant money for housing project. And uh, last fall, we also received a grant from Solid County to look at uh, emergency rental assistance and evictions uh, during COVID uh, last year. So the report uh, it was published on our website and I will share it in the chat for you to view. Um, I uh, would like now to introduce Otello Reggie Bean. Uh, Otello started with us last summer as an intern and basically 
the process was I received an email from him with his resume, wanted to do some research work on housing. And it took me a few days to get back to him because I had to do some research <laughs> because his resume looked too good to be truth. I was like, how in the world this person is reaching out to us? So anyway, uh, long story short, he started helping us with the conference and then he conducted some uh, research uh, looking at different states, landlord tenant laws and, you know, travel damages. And uh, in December, we received a grant from ARP Utah to produce uh, a report on the status of subsidized senior housing in the state of Utah. So we contracted with Otello and he's the author of the report and he will gonna present it today. Otello is graduating this May from NYU uh, Abu Dhabi School and he will gonna continue with a great internship over the summer with a social justice organization out of Oakland. And then in the fall, he's going to Beijing to get his master's degree. And what I would like to say, Otello, that we are so lucky and so grateful to have you work with us. And not only that you're smart, you're humble, and you're a kind person, you're funny, and you care about people, and we cannot wait for you to see what you're going to achieve. With that being said, Otello, um, you're welcome to start your presentation. Thank you so much, Francisca. <laughs> I was like, who I'm about to um, cry, but thank you both to Francisca and Tara. Um, as she mentioned, I sent a ton of cold emails to um, a lot of organizations in the state working on um, housing, and they were one of the few who responded. Um, and it's really just been life-changing both um, for my journey as an advocate and as a researcher. So thank you both so, so much for the work that you do um, and for your investment in me. Um, but I will start um, with the presentation um, of the report. Um, so the report is entitled Preserving Affordable Senior Housing Matters. It was made possible um, through funding by AARP Utah. Um, so thank you. Um, so here is an outline of um, the report as well as my presentation for today. So first I'll be discussing the problem, which is senior housing subsidy expiration. Then I'll be um, um, sort of diving into the outcome of this problem, which is unnecessary displacement. Then I'll be contextualizing the issue. Um, and then we'll be concluding with our solution, which as indicated by the title is senior housing preservation. So before I dive into um, the key findings of the research, here are some technicalities. So first we pulled our data from the National Housing Preservation Database, which provides project specific information on federally subsidized housing projects. So projects subsidized through programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, Housing Choice Vouchers, um, RD515, if you're familiar. Um, so these are federally subsidized housing properties and our sample specifically looks at um, subsidized properties in Utah that target low income seniors. Um, so our sample consists of 7,455 subsidized housing units. And um, a little bit about that sample, almost half of those um, units target extremely low income seniors. 40% um, are nonprofit owned and 30% are for-profit owned. Over half are um, subsidized through the low income housing tax credit. And then over 35% are subsidized through um, Section 8 housing choice vouchers. And then um, this sample is spread across the state and is located in 21 of Utah's 29 counties. Oopsies, there we go. Um, and so this is a map um, from the interactive tool that accompanies the report. I'll be walking you all through how to use that tool at the end of this presentation. But what this map shows is that subsidy expiration is not isolated to one specific region in Utah. It's a statewide issue. And so it needs a statewide solution. So here are our um, findings from the report. So first, um, kind of the main finding is that 41% of these federally subsidized senior housing units could be lost by 2045. What I mean by that is that when a subsidy expires, the property owner reserves the right to convert the unit from affordable housing to market rate housing. And once that conversion takes place, the unit is permanently lost as the source of affordable housing. 
we look to this next finding, we see that 15% of the sample could be lost by 2030 due to subsidy expiration. So this is not sort of a, an issue that's far out into the future. It is um, creeping up on us. And so we need to be planning ahead um, for this potential loss. And then finally, 53% of units um, could become unaffordable over the next 25 years. So these units are funded through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit um, or LIHTC. And LIHTC funded housing in Utah is not necessarily at risk of expiration within the next 25 years, but because LIHTC determines rent by area median income and not a tenant's income, um, LIHTC rents rise as housing prices rise. So this is particularly concerning in the Wasatch Front where we've already seen dramatic rent increases. And we've already heard from low-income seniors that they're struggling to afford LIHTC rent increases. Um, so our next finding is a projection of the annual loss of, this, of these units. So we project that 120 units could be lost each year. And um, figure two shows that um, about 1,000 of these units could be lost by 2030 and about 3,000 by 2045. Figure two doesn't consider how many units we're gaining each, each year. And so when we take into consideration that we're adding about 182 units each year to our subsidized senior housing stock, we find that 120 of these units, of these new units are just going to replace the ones that we're losing. So two thirds of the units that we're gaining each year are just compensating for subsidy expiration. And we're only netting about 62 units each year. So this shows, um, so figure four shows how um, subsidy expiration minimizes the impact of subsidized housing development. If we follow, and let me see if my pointer works. If we follow this um, projected growth um, of about 182 units each year, in 2045, we could expect um, about 15,000 units. But due to subsidy expiration, that number will probably be just a little over 12,000 units. And so you can see we have this 3,000 unit gap, which is expected to widen as the years go on and as um, sort of later in the future when some of those light tech units become eligible for market rate conversion. And then finally, we need to um, acknowledge the human component to these findings. So with every unit loss, a low income senior loses their um, source of stable housing. So we project that 3000 subsidies will expire by 2045, which means that 3000 3, senior households are at risk of being displaced. And so the consequence of subsidy expiration, as I just mentioned, is unnecessary displacement and forced relocation. Um, and this is particularly concerning for seniors because they're an already vulnerable population. And studies show um, that um, unnecessary displacement negatively impacts physical and mental health. It deprives seniors of their access to healthcare. It disrupts their crucial and vital social networks. And then it increases their likelihood of experiencing homelessness. So there are two factors that are really important to understand um, the implications of subsidy expiration. The first of which is seniors distinct financial circumstances, which make their affordable housing needs um, distinct from um, other Utahns. Um, so the main contributing or one of the contributing factors to um, their financial circumstances is that most seniors do not work for a wage. So only 40% of seniors um, over the age of 55 work for a wage and that number drops dramatically for seniors over the age of 65 as only 18% um, work for a wage. Thus, a lot of seniors rely on social security and um, supplemental security income or SSI for their income. Um, according to the Urban Institute, Social Security and SSI account for about 72% of low-income seniors' income. And to put this into perspective, Social Security provides an annual payment of about um, $8,100, um, which is about $675 a month. This is pre-tax. Um, the state of Utah does tax um, Social Security, so this number is, of course, lower. Um, after um, taxes are taken out. And then SSI provides an annual payment of about $9,400, which is about $780 a month. So we can already kind of tell from those who are familiar with um, rental prices um, in the state of Utah, that these um, incomes are ins insufficient to afford housing, healthcare, okay, and other so necessities. 
Uh, oh, no worries. Um, and so what happens is um, a lot of seniors are left with this trade-off between housing, healthcare, and food. And so on page eight of the report, um, we share the story of a Latinx senior who spent 90% of his income on um, light tech housing mm -hmm. in downtown Salt Lake, um, which left little to um, cover medical and food costs. So each month he was deciding, well, I have to put this money to the rent. Am I going to get my medication for the month or am I going to get my food? Um, another sort of undertone in this story is that um, there are racial disparities um, within the senior community. Um, so African-American and Latinx seniors are more than twice as likely to have insufficient incomes as their white um, counterparts. And so they're that much more vulnerable to the um, implications of having a um, insufficient income. The first of which is um, not being able to afford housing in the housing market. So as we can see from figure seven, um, this shows the rent affordable to a senior on um, supplemental security income, um, which is about $235 a month. And it shows this number relative to fair rent um, statewide for a studio, one bedroom and two bedroom. So what we can see is that um, an SSI dependent senior would have to pay 75% um, of their income to afford a studio apartment, 90% of their income to afford a one bedroom, and then a two bedroom um, at $850 a month is effectively out of reach. So um, low income seniors are priced out of the housing market and are forced to turn to the affordable housing market, but unfortunately um, there are not that many options in the affordable housing market. Um, either. And so most affordable housing is targeting Utahns who make between this 30% AMI and 60% AMI level. So somewhere um, in between here, depending on the program. Um, and if we look down to an SSI dependent senior, um, they make about 10% of statewide AMI. So um, what this means is that when a senior loses their housing to a subsidy ex there's even fewer options available to them in the affordable housing market because of their distinct financial circumstances. And then also we have um, the senior homelessness crisis, which is also um, kind of heightens the implications of subsidy expiration. So due to insufficient incomes, a growing number of low-income seniors are forced into homelessness. Um, and this crisis is expected to you know, balloon due to rising housing and healthcare costs that we're experiencing nationwide. So figure 10 shows the annual increase in um, senior homelessness in Utah, specifically seniors who are accessing homelessness services provided through the state of Utah. Um, and so what we can see is that within less than 10 years, this number almost tripled, um, growing by about 157 seniors each year. So we quite literally cannot afford to lose units to subsidy expiration because seniors are already at a heightened risk of homelessness and are priced out of the affordable housing market. So expanding the supply of affordable senior housing, which should include the provision of supportive housing, would not only help curb the affordable senior housing crisis, crisis but would also help um, alleviate the senior homelessness crisis. So moving into what we can do to prevent subsidy expiration, and that is um, senior housing preservation. So preservation is a crucial first line of defense that protects the existing supply of affordable senior housing while the state continues to develop and rehabilitate more units. Um, most preservation efforts involve some form of capital reinvestment in a unit um, once its subsidy expires. So this can be um, rental um, assistance, uh, project-based rental assistance. This can also just be a transfer and ownership, say from a for-profit entity to a public or nonprofit entity. Um, but there are several barriers um, that exist um, that particularly affect a lot of our subsidized senior housing properties that we must address before um, we kind of dive into um, the approach of preservation. So the first is deferred property maintenance. Um, a lot of the properties in our sample are more than 30 years old, and so they require substantial um, renovations that will need funding um, beyond just the um, replacement funding provided um, through a preservation effort. Additionally, some of these buildings are almost 100 years old. So not only do they need funding for um, much needed building repairs, but they also need financial financing for seismic insurance and improvements. 
And then finally, zoning restrictions present a barrier to building new affordable housing. So this underscores the importance of preserving our existing supply while we can remedy the inconsistencies in municipal zoning codes. So we offer four policy recommendations to state and local governments in Utah um, or to the state government and local governments in Utah. Um, the first is that senior housing preservation needs to be a statewide priority because it is a statewide issue. Um, so essentially we call on the, uh, the state and local governments to incorporate senior housing preservation, specifically a roadmap for expiring units in moderate income housing plans. Um, we should also have a dedicated source of funding for senior housing preservation. And it's important that this is separate from existing affordable housing and preservation funds because of seniors distinct financial circumstances. Oh, there we go. Um, cities should also adopt age-friendly zoning codes. And according to the Urban Institute, these codes should provide a variety of affordable housing and transportation options. They should be connecting individuals to community resources. And they should also promote independence and healthy lifestyles. Um, additionally, cities should take advantage of recent state legislation that makes accessory dwelling units um, or ADUs more accessible. So here I'm referring to House Bill 82, um, which allows internal ADUs and residential zones. And then it also creates a two year loan program for the creation of ADUs. And then finally, um, the cities and the state need to implement a one year notification requirement for expiring subsidized units. So low income tenants must know when their subsidized housing um, expires so that they can work with advocates and nonprofits to plan low risk relocation plans. Um, notification requirements should also be extended to mandate timely notifications of market rate um, conversions as well. And so in conclusion, unless Utah acts now to preserve its expire, expiring subsidized senior housing, the state could lose 120 of the 182 units it is projected to gain each year. Senior housing preservation would not only maintain the affordability of the existing senior housing supply, but it would also avert the unnecessary displacement of thousands of lower income Utahns. So before I um, turn it over for questions, I wanted to walk you all through briefly how to use the um, interactive mapping tool. Um, so here is a map of um, all of the um, senior housing, so federally subsidized senior housing properties in our sample. And so if you click on a property, um, you can see a little bit more information about who the target tenant is, um, the number of seniors it serves, whether or not it's funded through LIHTC, um, and so on. Um, and just to give you a brief legend, so um, the, the darker kind of more burgundy the dot is, the closer it is to expiration and then the lighter it is, the further away it is from expiration. You can also toggle in between um, LIHTC funded senior housing specifically. So you can look at those 53% of properties that I mentioned that have affordability concerns um, unique to the LIHTC program. And then we can also see just the characteristics of the neighborhoods that these properties are located in. So are the properties located in a food desert, um, a healthcare desert, it's popping up, okay, um, a transit desert. Um, and if we zoom in on, oh, sorry, it took me to the east of the state. If we zoom in on the Wasatch Front, we can look at community services. So are the properties near a social security office, which is important for um, the senior, many seniors. And then also are these properties located in high poverty neighborhoods? And so the hope is that um, policymakers will be able to use this tool to identify um, senior housing properties at risk of expiration in their um, districts and their communities, and then we'll be able to plan for the preservation of these properties. So thank you all so much for um, listening. And I think um, we have some time for questions, um, but I'll turn it over to Francis. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Otello. So um, please uh, ask your question in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself. I know there's some folks in the meeting that actually um, uh, were part of the reviewing group uh, before the report was made public and I would like to thank them very much. Um, and um, yeah, go ahead and ask your questions, please. Uh, 
I have a quick question. <clears throat> um, my name is Brent Hutchison, and I'm with uh, Community Action Services in Provo. Um, that very last map that you showed with the layers, how do we access that? And is that accessible for free? Is there any kind of paywall? <clears throat> so it's completely free. Um, Francisca, do you want to maybe re um, put put the link again in the chat? So it's linked in the report, and then Francisca will put okay. the link in the chat. But it's publicly accessible, available to use um, by anybody. Awesome. Thanks. So, <laughs> see, you're, you're muted, Francisca. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, um, Brent. I posted a little bit at the beginning um, our webpage that has a link to the actual PDF, and then at the bottom there is a link to the map. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome, Paul. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, I'm Paul Davis. I work with the Bear River Association of Governments, and I also work with the Homeless Council up here, the Bear River Homeless Council. And we've been asked by elected officials in kind of the rumors floating around that there's the $1.6 billion worth of discretionary money that is coming the way of the state through the uh, American Rescue Plan that's coming. <clears throat> Does anybody have a plan to ask for some substantial pieces to construct new uh, senior housing out of those dollars? Um, it seems to me, that, I mean, I'm dealing with affordable housing issues and and there's no way an independent builder can afford to build a facility right now and make it pay. It's just too expensive. So it's going to sure. require other dollars to do it. I was just wondering if somebody from the Housing Coalition was working on a proposal to get some more housing built. Uh, I'll certainly do some up here, but uh, statewide, we need to raise the visibility and ask for a plan statewide to try and build where it's needed. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Paul, thank you so much for the question. So the the 1.6 billion that it's coming to the state of Utah. So uh, not the cities, not the counties. Um, a portion of it, it counts the latest stimulus check that we got after the spring bill. But with that being said, so we submitted to um, the Utah Commission on Housing Affordability and to the Executive Appropriations Committee through Senator Luz Escamilla, a list of items, of housing items that need and require immediate attention. And it does include senior housing. It was a good question in the chat, I think from Sarah Moore. Um, about uh, wouldn't new housing be rented out at the same rates as current? So if it's enough, so here's the biggest um, issue that we're having. It's almost impossible for a developer to build affordable housing for 30% of AMI or below. And this is where our most of our seniors are because they're on fixed income. So what we have been proposing is to have, um, you know, um, a senior housing voucher to be project based. Now, if we're, it will require a lot of work, a lot of advocacy work, but will require also, you know, you as individuals and as your organizations to, to connect with your elected officials to let them know. So um, our legislators uh, need to be aware that, you know, our most vulnerable the seniors on fixed income who are very low income need our help. And I know we have a representative on the call. So representative uh, Waite, I'm not sure if you'd like to add anything on this. Thanks, Francisca. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm following the, the dialogue. I actually am on the board of a senior um, facility where we, <clears throat> our mission is to provide um, senior affordable, affordable senior housing. And a question that I do have is um, about your view on, um, again, and, and a way of um, 
providing funds to help preservation. Um, so that comes in. But the other question that I had that I was going to just put in the chat or um, contact you about is how does this connect with um, HUD housing provisions, the vouchers that are all already available through HUD? The current vouchers or the ones that were passed through the American Relief Plan Act? Um, I think just the regular ones, because I'm kind of thinking of what was going on before mm -hmm. and that as, as where we will eventually return. But I'm seeing with this report that this issue isn't going to go away with COVID. It's just, I mean, obviously, and, and we knew that before. And yeah. that's something legislators sometimes have a difficult time understanding that the, the whole, whole concept of investment in order to avoid a whole bunch of, in this case, a whole bunch of, of um, seniors without suitable housing. The, the problem we're up against up here is, is that the HUD FMR, fair market rate housing, is not keeping up with the inflated rate of the apartments. And therefore, okay. there's, even if we had a Section 8 housing voucher that we could give someone, it is very difficult for them to find housing that, that meets the requirements that HUD puts on as far as for market rate housing. And so we have to find housing that that meets HUD, the FMR rating to be able to use the vouchers. And that's the challenge we're up against is we probably have 20 people looking for places right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I hope I contributed, if, it, if only by some other questions to consider. Yes, uh, Tara, would you like to add anything for the representative to know? Um, we actually have done, I'm sure that um, the representative saw the list of items that we were asking for in terms of the CARES Act um, funding. Um, two of the items that um, didn't make it onto our list, but I verbally have talked with other legislators and leaders is one is that we need a statewide um, housing affordability um, database where somebody can search for um, housing. Uh, we have a lot of um, landlords that will take Section 8, they prefer to take Section 8, and it would be great to have a list of those um, in a database that somebody can search. Um, you know, a database would be really helpful in terms of people knowing where the properties are. Um, even if there's a waiting list, at least people can get on a waiting list. Um, so we are working on that, and I know Claudia. Um, several years ago brought social serve um, back to our state. And so that is one of the examples that I had given um, to the housing commission. Um, also, um, I really feel like if UDOT and um, UTA and others um, can put together, you know, a roadmap for the work that they're going to be doing in the future, I think that it would be helpful for us to do a study and do a roadmap, um, you know, to increase housing, the inventory. And I think preservation would be a big piece of it. And um, I think, you know, if we could plan for the future, um, rather than always reacting, um, I think that would be helpful. Um, and so, yeah, those are just two of the other items and we'd be happy to share um, with the group, um, you know, uh, the other recommendations. We are trying to think of some comment in the chat box that um, indicates if there are projects that you know that could be shovel ready, um, that could be used for, you know, with CARES Act funding, you know, please send it to Bill at Crossroads. Um, he is, you know, keeping the list um, of projects. So 
I think also, Paul, um, your question to, you know, really how to get better engaged in how that money is going to be spent is, I would reach out to your representatives and senators, um, senator in your area that you serve and talk about what the need is and um, what you're up against and even trying to get out, you know, a voucher in, in your town, something livable, um, safe to live in for someone. Yeah, we, we're already working with the state senator. He's uh, brand new. Chris Wilson is a state senator from up here that covers Logan. And we're working with it. But the problem is, is every builder that's up here is building as fast as they can. It's probably, if you read the article in the Tribune last week, you know that, that all the builders in the state are building as fast as they can. And there's not any money in affordable housing. There's money in in single family and apartments that they can rent for fifteen hundred dollars a month, and so. Well, one of the things we them, did, go ahead. One of the things that we did suggest in our list is to buy down units that are being built that or have already been built. Um, you know, we need to engage you know new developers in the concept that. Um, of affordable housing and look at it differently. Um, but buying down units could be extremely helpful um, for stuff that's already on the ground. Yeah, we're, we're doing, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what Keith Warburton has done with buying some motels and converting them to, to the, the biggest challenge with buying an old motel is, is of course accessibility issues. And, and as was touched on earlier in the presentation, you know, the earthquake safety issues that, that are come into play when you start retrofitting something that was built 40 and 50 years ago. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad that you're doing the work that you're doing up there and I look forward to connecting with you. Certainly. There are a couple of questions in the chat yeah, um, that's... that I wanted to Go ahead. Address. So the first is about, um, so it says, could you please elaborate on age friendly zoning codes? What zoning barriers do you see? So um, in the report, we specifically, so I guess to, I'll take that question in two. So the first is specific zoning barriers. So the main um, zoning barrier is that a lot of the um, existing zoning codes are like where um, senior housing properties are zoned is not specific to their needs. Um, so like a lot of the zones are, um, I'm trying to look, they're like multifamily um, residential, single family residential facilities that these properties require in addition to the housing that they provide. And then with some of these special zones, so um, various cities either call them senior housing overlay zones or elderly housing um, overlay zones. Um, there are actually restrictions on acreage size and the number of units that can be um, offered. Um, and um, what we found with our, what our, our partners found is that um, these zone types are actually suitable for townhomes, not the multifamily properties that um, a lot of these subsidized senior housing properties um, need to be just to reach as many low income seniors as they can. Um, so the hope is that an we sort of cater to some of the recommendations that I mentioned provided by the Urban Institute, but that it would also take into consideration the unique kind of zoning based needs um, of these properties, specifically as they relate to acreage size, number of units, and also just like the number of facilities or the types of facilities um, that are allowed. So like mixed use rather than explicitly or exclusively residential. Um, and then there was also a question or quite a bit of questions about um, like, I guess how I interpret it is like subsidized. I'm trying to actually find a specific question. So like subsidized rents. I remember there was a question about like would a solution that was based on the seniors income work more so than say LIHTC, which is based off of um, area media income. So there's one um, technical point um, that like LIHTC housing choice vouchers, um, even project-based rental assistance provided by HUD, those are federal programs. So it's not 
there, um, the state can't necessarily adjust how the rents are determined by those programs because that's um, determined or those they're restricted by the federal government. Um, but one of the things that Francisca mentioned and that we propose is project-based rental assistance that can start um, with senior housing properties and then can hopefully be expanded to um, other low-income renters. Um, yeah, Otello, but those are just some of the two that I found. Yeah, Otello, I just wanna address a couple of uh, questions or maybe one uh, very, very quickly. Um, so one came from Sarah Moore. How can we create a conversation about lowering rent or freezing rent for those most at risk? Politically, we're not gonna happen. That's the reality. Um, and we're not going there uh, because we're not just not gonna happen in Utah. Um, Gina has a question, can the price for senior housing be according to a measurement of their income and held to that? Well, ideally that should be available for everyone. You know, I mean, uh, that's why when we talk about um, housing that people can afford is that no one should pay more than 30% of their income on rent or mortgage and utilities. Um, that's the formula for success. But what's happening is that um, in the, um, rental market for uh, buildings that do not have any kind of subsidy, uh, people, low income folks are paying a lot of them 50% of their income on rent. So that's kind of the market working its way. And that's why we wanna make the case to the findings of, of the report and why is government needed to, to uh, make sure our seniors are housed. Otella, I will let you answer Caitlin Meyer's question. Caitlin is with Moab City, just to give you a little bit of context. And she's yeah, on our so, board as well. Um, so I'll just read over the question because it's a little bit higher up in the chat. So um, let's see. So other than a dedicated funding source for senior housing preservation that can be used to subsidize, um, do you have any policy recommendations for how to ensure income restricted housing stays affordable for seniors? How do we stop um, seniors from being priced out of housing um, as incomes increase? Um, kind of getting to what I was just mentioning about um, like project-based rental assistance um, or the expansion of that for low income seniors that will help um, because so one of our partners at um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, was actually the one um, who he wrote a paper or an article about um, LIHTC housing specifically and noted that um, a huge issue for LIHTC housing is for seniors or the issue becomes more salient when a senior doesn't have an access or access to another subsidy. Um, so like another form of preservation could be, okay, these units are either becoming unaffordable due to um, AMI increases, or they're um, going to be converted to market rate. Let's provide them with a voucher that's based off of their um, income. Um, so that it would take into consideration that they only need to be paying 30% of their or um, AMI. Um, and so that will allow them to stay in their unit, um, sort of regardless of whether or not it's um, being offered at a market rate um, price. So like those types of solutions that are, um, they are preservation strategies, but they don't have to be used exclusively for preservation, could help um, low income seniors afford um, housing in a market that as we have seen, like housing prices and rental prices specifically are just dramatically increasing. Um, not exclusively in the Wasatch Front, um, but also in some um, other counties up north and to the east and even to the south. So um, great question and definitely something to consider. And there was also a, one of the first questions um, that I wanted to turn over to you, Francisca and Tara, is how um, this information will be shared with legislators. I was actually just going to look at it because I read it. And then we got more questions. So Heidi, thank you so much for this question. So we at the coalition, we talked with the folks at ARP Utah, how we're gonna move forward. And you know, uh, so just to let you know, unfortunately no one from their organization could be present at the meeting today because they, they already had something in the calendar before we set it up this morning. 
uh, set up this meeting. With that being said, we are planning to send a hard copy of the report to every single legislator, so represent, House representative and state senator. Um, and we will follow up with emails and trying to connect with them. Of course, time is the essence here because our legislators are meeting in the first special session this year, um, third Wednesday, May, in May, which is not far away from today. Um, with that being said, that doesn't mean the legislators were going to spend all of the money, uh, you know, this month. So this is kind of a process, but um, sharing this information with them uh, will be very important to the advocacy work. And also we're going to share this with the congressional uh, delegation. So they will be aware what's the status of senior housing um, in their own state. Um, so I answered that one. There was uh, another question from Gina. Uh, also, would tiny homes work in some type of plan and be more affordable? So the tiny homes are always an option, you know, like, and the only serious plan that we have seen so far is coming from Salt Lake City Mayor Mendenhall to build this tiny home village in partnership with a nonprofit organization. So I think we're all gonna be watching that because this, that seriously, that's the first time, you know, a project it's coming, it's unfolding and we'll address this. And, you know, with, with tiny homes, uh, like with anything else is where you're gonna find land to put the homes. Like we don't know yet where Salt Lake City will gonna have their village unless Tony or Lani can tell us but if it's not public, it's not public yet. So, um, so I guess we are gonna be watching that. Um, and then- I just wanted to add, I'll add to that. So I've heard through the grapevine as well that there's some movement down south in um, Cedar City um, that is trying to put some tiny home, um, a village together as well. So hopefully we'll be hearing more about that and getting some updates. Um, I'm not really sure why it has taken us so long to you know to work on that particular issue um and and hopefully you know the red tape will come down from that and we may see some other temporary or permanent um places so um i think it's part of the inventory that we need you know it's not the silver bullet but we need all kinds of answers when it comes to you know, trying to increase the inventory of housing people can afford. Thank you, Tara. And, um, you know, the other thing I want to say is that we spoke at the beginning of the money that is coming to the state, to the state legislature. At the same time, cities and counties are receiving money as well. So for example, Salt Lake City, we're gonna receive the most, it's about $87 million. And that's coming from American Rescue Plan Act. And I know we've been uh, in touch with the League of Cities and Towns. So everybody's waiting for the guidance from the treasury on how to spend this money. What we're doing, the advocacy and education we're doing is that, yes, there is a focus on infrastructure. Housing is this infrastructure, you know, and, Again, praising again, Salt Lake City Mayor uh, Aaron Mendenhall yesterday uh, was made public uh, the budget and their plan to address affordable housing in the city. And, you know, we love it because, you know, it is um, putting the money where the, the words are, you know, and it's a lot about affordable housing and it's a lot about addressing, you know, housing uh, inequality on the west side of the city. So we're very, very grateful for that. So again, you know, we have to talk for state legislators, but also we have to talk with our cities and the mayors and the city council people, uh, you know, where housing and infrastructure, this is a, you know, uh, a great opportunity to put some money where it's needed for affordable housing, you know, buying land for affordable housing, building new housing, preserving new housing, and, you know, um, looking seriously at the issue. Uh, 
I would like uh, to thank Representative Waite for being in this meeting and the fact that she is encouraging all of us to, to make the advocacy uh, work uh, because there is affordable housing consideration and UDOT and UTI planning. That's absolutely true. We at the coalition, we rely on our partners uh, to, to kind of guide us through this kind of work. So we work closely, not only with the League of Cities and Towns, with the Wasatch Front Regional Council. And a lot of times we, we go to them for guidance. Okay, what are the next steps? Additionally, we work with the Utah Housing, uh, with the Utah Commission on Housing Affordability. So uh, I mentioned in the beginning that they are aware of our item lists where the state can put money for affordable housing. We're also planning to uh, present this report to them in one of their meetings. So tell them be ready. Um, and we're gonna share with them the, the report. So, um, you know, that will require a lot of work, but now, you know, for years, Tara wanted to have this done. And finally, you know, we had the grant, we had an excellent researcher and we got it done. So now it's the work that we have to do to get the word out. We have about five minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any other question for Otello? My question is, What's next for you? Um, for Otello? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as um, Francisca mentioned, I will be getting my master's next year as a Schwarzman scholar in Beijing, China. And then after that, looking to go to law school. So um, for sure, the next four years, I won't be in Utah. Um, I also have um, a second hometown of Portland, Oregon. Um, where I grew up and went to high school and so on. So um, looking to move there, but I'll always have roots in Utah as long as my mom stays here. So yeah, it's always an option. It's become more of an option um, through the work that I've done um, with the Utah Housing Coalition. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll make sure we stay in touch with Otello because as we can see, we can, we can work on Zoom and he can be in Beijing and but he can do a presentation or he can work on some report. But anyway, we're very, very grateful. Uh, so uh, does anyone has any announcements for the whole group that we need to be aware of? Well, I just wanna point out that we um, are planning our conference right now. And we're um, pretty sure that we're going to be able to do it in person, and it will be in um, it will be up on the Wasatch back in Zermatt. And so Monday we're going to have some activities um, like golf tournament, fly fishing, mountain biking, and so that will be August 30th, and then August 31st will be the first day of the conference and it will end on Wednesday. Um, if you have any ideas or wants um, for conference topics, we are still in, you know, we're still working on those. Um, nothing's definite and we can always um, move things around um, if there's something, you know, a big need. Um, also, um, you know, I really want to encourage everyone to reach out to their state legislator um, and just tell them how important it is for housing and it, what it means to the community um, to thrive um, because we can't do it on our own. We really need more people, you know, contacting legislators statewide um, to message that. Um, so yes, this um, Otello, we thank you so much for this report, and um, we hope that we continue, you know, a really strong relationship because um, you definitely have, have, you know, brought a lot of great things um, to the to our organization. Two other reports that he did, just to let you know, um, are one is he researched um, the housing courts. Um, in the United States. And so we have that report. We also have a report on um, every state and whether or not they do treble damages. And so 
Um, if anybody's interested in those reports, um, we can definitely, you know, send those out um, to you. And um, yeah, thank you. Hopefully we'll be doing some stuff um, in person, you know, in the next few months. And because um, I always miss those five minutes at the end of meetings, you know, if they get out early and walk into the car and, you know, talking to people. Sometimes that is some of the um, best um, networking that can be done. So hopefully we'll be doing that soon. But, you know, I think Zoom has definitely had its, you know, positive sides as well. So, um, so thank everyone. Thank you everyone for joining and let's keep up the great work that we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. And once again, uh, a big welcome to Olga, to our group and uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, yeah, um, you'll get more emails from us. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.